Welcome back to With the Greatest Respect, John Bertrand AO. John is a living Australian sporting legend. His life has been full of success, most known as skipper of Australia 2, sailing the boat to victory in 1983, ending 132 years of American dominance in the America's Cup. John has seen yachting success all his life and recently has given back to the community through roles such as President of Swimming Australia, changing much in his years there. That definitely played a role in the dominant performance by the Australian swimming team in Tokyo. John is an inspiring Australian and a wonderful leader in our community. Enjoy John Bertrand. Good morning, John Bertrand, and thank you for agreeing to do this. It's very kind of you. My great pleasure. <laughs> Have you done many of these before? I've done a few, and I find I find them pretty damn interesting, actually. And and I really look. In addition, I I was walking with a friend this morning, and you know, and, and uh, walking and talking is a really important part of of living, and uh, particularly with COVID. My wife, Raza, said that, you know, get off your ass, John, and walk with some interesting characters around the tan. And I took her advice, as I always do, and it's been illuminating, I must say. And us men don't, in my opinion, we don't talk enough. And we actually talk when we walk much more easily compared to, I think, women, you know, they can transcend any environment and they can, you know, get to know each other much more rapidly. But anyway, so walking around the tan has been a, a breakthrough in many ways. With some interesting characters as a result yeah <laughs> all right well let's uh let's delve into it it's a it is a a wonderful story john yours and it's a story that um is now an essential part of australia's history and we'll go into that in a l- little bit more detail in a moment but um this whole thing is about inspiring people and, and giving people um some inspiration to see what people have done in their lives and and i think if we can touch a few people along the way here it'll be great because I know you've touched my life in a, in a very meaningful way so I want to talk to you firstly about your childhood and I know um, your story uh, is a really interesting one around your childhood your father passed away of lung cancer when you were 15 did you have you got um, a lot of memories of your dad I know uh, Razi your wife said to me that he was a workaholic and rarely home what, what are your memories of your dad well, that he worked so much. We actually had a back shed, which was the which was the our little factory. We mum and dad had a, a little uh, company called Burlex Toys. My my mum's name Beryl, my father Lex Burlex, a soft toy manufacturing company. And dad, well, first of all, he died when he was fifty of lung cancer. His father died of lung cancer at fifty, both chain smokers, and in that era when people had stress, the doctors invariably would recommend they take up smoking. Really? Yeah. It's amazing. So, you know, how life has changed and science has, you know, obviously opened up a whole range of knowledge, including the whole concept of of cancer and lung cancer. But Dad stressed out heavily over within the business. And when Dad died, we didn't have enough money for the funeral. And... There was no fallback, you know, no superannuation, no nothing. And mum had two kids, myself, I was 15, my brother Lex, 17, both going to Mordial Chelsea High School. And, uh, you know, just no money, but fascinating. So mum, you know, talk about backs to the wall. She was able to get a, a loan from the local uh, bank, one of the local banks, and she created new uh, prototypes of teddy bears and koalas and took them to Sydney and hired the biggest suite at the Hilton Hotel in Sydney, all on, you know, bank's money. <laughs> no MBA from Harvard. Like, you know, it's just, you know, gut feel. And she got a suite at the Hilton where mirrors were in the background, so it made the, the, the prototypes look larger. And she got the buyers from Myers and David Jones and Fossies in that era to come to her instead of her going cap in hand with a, in a, with a suitcase full of teddy bears. And she sold a, a year's production in one week, being in Sydney. Then came back to Melbourne, hired the local church hall down at Chelsea Village shopping centre, which wasn't being used at the time, fitted it out 
and we basically built a company. So here's mum, who up until then was stuffing teddy bears and, and developing prototypes and dad out there through country Victoria selling these, uh, you know, teddies, doing it hard. And then mum was released. She was the entrepreneur in our family, as it turns out. So it, it's, and she, and there was no fallback. So that's kind of, you know, that's, that's my mother and my grandmother could add up figures faster than you could put into a computer in a head. And so my grandmother and mother effectively built this, uh, you know, this little soft toy company. And you go on Google, Burlex Toys is still, you know, it's a, a case study of, you know, one of the beautiful, uh, you know, soft toys in that era, a long time ago. And John, you, li you lived in a cul-de-sac, didn't you, where the, the, the whole family pretty much was around you. You had extended family living down the road and it, it must have been, there must have been great times, despite the fact that your father passed away early. It was grandfather, grandmother, uncle, aunt, all in Bristol Avenue in Chelsea. And I, uh, I got a, uh, a scholarship to go to Monash University, Commonwealth Scholarship, graduated from Mordaic High, uh, and went over to Monash and met all these people that had been to Melbourne Grammar and Scotch and Wesley and so on. And David, my world was so insulated. My world was Chelsea Beach, Chelsea Footy Club, played footy at, uh, at the at under 15s and under 17s, mucked around with boats during in summer down at the Chelsea Yacht Club. That was my world. I had never heard, would you believe, of Wesley and Scotch. So, so when I look back in terms of my motivation, a lot of it comes back when I reflect back on meeting some of these characters who are all talking about what their fathers had done and who they knew in the terms of the Melbourne network. And this was totally foreign to me. And I thought part of it, I guess, looking back on so-called my motivation is I'll show these people because, you know, they were, I was excluded from the in crowd. It's interesting, isn't it? You know, how, what gets under, what, what sort of uh, drives people. And when I look back on it, because my upbringing was idyllic, but totally naive but beautiful in the process in many ways <laughs> and john your your values and principles which have certainly touched me over the years hard work work fair play um intensely driven did they come from your mum and your grandmother or were they formed through those formative years through university and that you just described no it came it came from the family network there's no question about it you know mum Grandmother, she was the she was the president of the Chelsea Yacht Club Women's Committee, and she would deliver twenty pounds, you know, pound sterling every year on a check to the Commodore at presentation and big English, you know, I want to say big big bo bosomed English woman, proud, straight up, and she wouldn't suffer fools, and that was part of my world, you know, my, that was Nan, my grandmother, and 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 Nan used to follow Billy. Uh, uh, the evangelist, uh, Billy Graham. He came to Melbourne at the MCG, 100,000 people turned up. I think it was, I think it was more actually, I think it was nearly 120,000. Yeah. Is that right? And i um, and my grandmother, Nan, sent me little, sent me little notes at different stages saying, Johnny, you can do anything if you want. And these were kind of the Billy Graham type, you know, lines. And again, those influences in hindsight were extremely important for, you know, little Johnny Bertrand down at Chelsea. <laughs> and when, is it because you were living at Chelsea that, that sailing fell into your lap or did you look, go looking for sailing? When, when did sailing come about? Well, you've got to have a little luck, luck in life, you know, T sections of life. And we, my brother and I climb over the back fence of a house down in, uh, in Chelsea and we'd be on Chelsea beach. So our playground was the beach, the sea, go along one kilometre and it was the Chelsea Yacht Club just by chance. So that was our that was our kindergarten and that was our play world. So summertime, no shoes, we just disappear in the morning, come back at night, God only knows how we survived, didn't matter. And mucking around with boats in summertime and playing footy uh, in winter. And you've always loved technology. You've always loved, um, and we'll, we'll, I'll talk a bit about technology uh, and the future of technology in a moment with you, but... When did your fascination um, come of technology and you know assessing weather and all that sort of thing? Is that because that also plays into the future as well? Yes. Well, the, the sport of sailing, as it turns out, is a highly complex sport. You know, you've got fluid dynamics, you've got hydro, aero, 
all these things. And I was fascinated with the flow of air, wind across sails and the shapes of sails, you know, when I was a little kid. And we used to put little telltales on the on the uh, on our sails. As it turns out, that's what they used in high performance gliders to to study, uh, you know, wind and uh, wind effects over the wings of, of gliders. So I was I got intrigued with this whole area of, um, of of fluids going around. Well, in this case, uh, sails and hulls. So that was a, a, you know part of my fascination in terms of loving the sport of sailing. And uh, as I tell kids, watching the bubbles go past, you know, we're talking about wind-driven vehicles here. There's no sound. So all you see is the bubbles go past. It's just unbelievable. And I can still see that the first time I actually went sailing with my brother in a little boat called a Sabo. And uh, all of that was kind of a fascination. And the complex, like, you know, the Olympic Games or America's Cup, you know, the sport of sailing is highly complex. You've got wind, water, you've got the opposition, you've got the thermodynamics of wind changing every 10, 15, 20 seconds in terms of wind direction and so on. You've got boat speed, you know, you know hundreds of a, of a, uh, a kilometre an hour, one hundredth of a kilometre an hour is a, is a meaningful dis differential in speed, would you believe? <laughs> and uh, all of those things add up and uh, that was all part of my world, looking back on it, you know. <laughs> so I was going to ask you about this later, but I'll ask you about it now. The one thing about you, John, that um, people may understand, I certainly have over the years, you have a fascination for knowledge and, and a thirst for knowledge like no other. When did that come about? And, and, and I, it's almost like it, it's also evolved even after 1983 as well and where you stop people in the street and generally interested about what they do where they live, what their business is. It's, it's been a big part of your life, hasn't it? Yes, it has. I, I remember Dad saying uh, at one stage that, you know, if you don't learn something new every day, you're a fool. And I'll never forget that. And, uh, and I've really, you know, I am a student of life. I, You know, most people, uh, you know, we've got a six-year-old little granddaughter. Her name is Goldie Rose, and she's, She's full of questions, you know, she says, Pops, why is the sky blue? And why can't we fly like a bird? You know, fantastic. And all these questions. Now, as it turns out, us humans tend to stop asking questions when we're 12, 13, 14 years old. And we move into a world where we just start talking about ourselves instead of, you know, what the rest of the world is doing. And the key from my perspective is just to be stu a student of life. And I've always enjo enjoyed that. And I encourage, you know, people around me, particularly, you know, if I'm in a mentoring role or whatever, it's fundamentally important that we have curiosity. That's, you know, we are not the keepers of all knowledge. And I've known that, you know, I've been at the top of the mountain, let's say with the, with the World of America's Cup, you know, champion of the world. And it became clear to me just after we won way back in 1983, you know, it beat the US of A, the America's Cup started before the US Civil War, so the Americans had never been defeated. You know, it's amazing when you look back on it. And it became clear to me when I was at the top of my mountain, that, in other words, the, the, the night that we won the America's Cup over in Newport, Rhode Island, I got to this sort of, sort of um, proverbial top and it became clear to me how little I knew, <laughs> you know, in terms of the, the, the whole financial structure of America's Cup going forward. They, again, the performance regime around aerodynamics and hydrodynamics, the building high performance teams, the world of sports psychology, decision making under extreme pressure. How do you just do that better in the future? As I say, it became clear to me how little I knew. And, and then you fast forward 20 years to the America's Cup, you know, then and even like now, well, it's more like 40 years, would you believe? It's just another world. You know, we're sailing around in this, in this particular wind speed at about uh, you know 15 kilometers an hour, and now they're doing 100 kilometers an hour, the same the same wind strength. It's a fa it was fascinating watching the last America's Cup as how quick those boats were going. Before we get onto that though, because that was a good segue into another question I had for you around your heroes in life, and everyone's got heroes and people they look up to. Who who are yours? Obviously, you've spoken about your mum and your grandmother, but yeah, who are the people that are inspiring you at age? You know, 15, 20, 25. Different people on, the, on my journey and continue to be. 
Um, certainly mum and dad and, you know, my grandparents and my uncle, you know, and it's a family environment. And then the commodore of the local yacht club, a guy called uh, Peter Hosking, who was, became a mentor for myself when dad died and uh, gave me his own, he moved up to another boat, but he gave me his own lightweight Sharpie, which allowed us to move into senior yacht racing in this country. Because we hadn't, you know, basically there's no money there in the family. He gave it to you. What yes, a nice gesture. Yep. On the basis of giving me a, you know, a start in, in because I'd won a whole bunch of championships in this, in the uh, VJs, uh, yeah, which is a junior training boat, but high performance anyway. Yeah, so Peter, and we sailed with Peter on his own boats, my brother and I. So we, I've had different mentors and guiding lights all the way through, and I still seek people out, you know, and I'm a mature age gentleman now, you know, but, you know, you never stop learning from people. That's really the key. And uh, so, you know, I mentioned, we were talking before, you know, I go around the town and I, I, I walk with a whole bunch of different, really interesting characters. And we all exchange and you know knowledge and it's interesting it's fun we have a lot of laughs but um, you know I'm, I'm personally always learning from other people now the person that i want to talk to you about who and you've had a lot of strong women in your life as we've referenced but your wife is uh I, i've got to say one of my heroes every time i meet raza um you know she is just full of life um quite an inspirational lady and you met, I think, uh, when she might have been 17, you were 18. Does that sound right? That's right. Way too young. And you met in, uh, you met at a jazz lounge, I think, <laughs> in St Kilda Road. Is that right? 431 St Kilda Road, which was the preeminent dance or you know, nightclub. It wasn't even called nightclub. It was a dance, I guess, in that era. And, uh, yeah, so she was a nurse, or she told me she was a nurse. As it turns out, she just started training. So she didn't know Arthur from Martha. And I was a um, still a student at uh, Lord Alec Chelsea High School. As I had my license for one day when myself and three mates from the Chelsea Yacht Club went up to 431 and, uh, you know, into the big smoke. And we came across a, four nurses, including Raza. Raza was the scariest of them all. <laughs> she was a real character. Can you and, remember uh, what time you got home? Well... To the point where uh, my brother became so worried, he notified the police. He thought I'd had an accident because the first night that I had the uh, the family car, <laughs> I ended up taking Raza out to Rosanna, which is like the middle of Australia. <laughs> then, <laughs> and uh, no Melways. And then you know, I was trying to get back to Chelsea, you know, so it took a long time. Uh, but that was, you know, we fought way too much, you know, in the early days. And anyway, we eventually got married when I was 23 and she was 22 and it's been a hell of a ride since it's been an incredible relationship and behind every great um, career there's there's always a partner that supports and she has been a great support through what would have been some pretty challenging times so we'll talk about 83 in a moment but 83 for you and your two boys uh, rather than the two boys being over in Newport must have been pretty tough well, yes, that's right. Well, we had three. We had a little... Um, the sunshine they, was born then, okay. Actually, no, we, we had one, two, yeah, two little boys and then eventually three later on, that's right, with that little girl. Yeah, it was tough. You know, again, no money. You'd increase your overdraft if you had that ability at the local bank to represent your country, you know. Um, it's just the way it was. Uh, but money had no relevance. It was, you know, just this whole issue of could we do it? Could we do something that no country had ever done? So Raza has been remarkable part of it is is that uh looking back on it you know when we got married we immediately we primarily went off to newport rhode island with my first america's cup project and that was with sir frank packer an old man packer he was the middleweight boxing champion of this, of australia during the depression he was a tough old bastard and that was a boat project called gretel two that was his second america's cup challenge and i was what did you get what did you get paid for being uh, part of the Gretel 2 campaign? At $12 a day. Wow. <laughs> uh, but that included food and board. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, but it was pretty special that we'd get anything, you know, it's just the way it was. And it was amateur hour. We got blown away by the Yanks. Yeah. And that was, but then we'd go forward four times and eventually we won it in 83. And Raza hung in there all the time, you know, and 
in that era, there was no consideration of wives or girlfriends or, lo or loved ones going with the team. You know, if uh, Rosa wanted to go with, with our, our kid or kids, then she'd go, you know, we'd figure out how we'd do it and find local accommodation in Newport. That, you know, the game has changed dramatically since then. You talk about the wives of AFL footballers and so on, the way they looked after relative to now, and as it should be too, you know, because the families are the support system behind any of these endeavours. John, talk to me about your um, love affair with the America's Cup. When did it start, the fascination to it? Explain to me also the New York Yacht Club because that's an amazing institution that obviously is a part of the America's Cup story. What was your earliest recollection of the America's Cup and when did you start the fascination with it? Well, I remember way back in 1962, I was a little kid listening on the, on the, on the wireless called the radio now listening to Jock Sturrock surf past uh, with Gretel 1, surf past Wedley to win one of the races of the America's Cup. And it was a big deal then, I remember. Uh, and I was sort of, you know, mucking around. Well, I was actually sailing at a fairly high level in junior racing boats then. And uh, it, was, it was intriguing. The whole thing was intriguing. And the technology was intriguing for me as well. You know, so the first America's Cup that we did was 1970 with Sir Frank Gretel 2, and after, after that uh, particular challenge, as I say, we got wiped off the water yet again. But then I went to MIT and did a Master of Science at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I had a scholarship there. And Raza went across and uh, worked at Boston City Hospital dr delivering drug-addicted babies. You know, tough environment. We lived in Medford again. You know, people say it would have been wonderful. Well, I remember we are bloody cold. We could, a lot of cases, couldn't afford the um, heating for during winter time. And I'd borrow money off my professor to pay for the rent in some cases. So again, you know, this is whole early days and Raza being able to stay with this program. And, uh, but you know, we've just had an incredible journey as a result of that, doing amazing stuff, driving around America on a BMW 650 motorcycle, you know, with a total budget of 75 bucks for three months. And America played a big part in your life, didn't it? You spent a lot of time there. I've heard you talk about Americans and, the philosophy of failing fast and um, yeah. and the impact that America had on you, that it played a role, didn't it? Absolutely. And the Americans are in the business, they'll eat their grandmother if required. Hmm. It's the best way you can describe the competitive nature of the United States. And you so you never back against the Yanks in anything. You know, they're just highly educated race, very intelligent, just like we are in this country. But they've got this motivation that anyone can do it. Anyone can become the, the, uh, the president of the United States. From any background, doesn't matter what school you went to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And the way they ascertain success is via their wealth. And okay, so that's that doesn't sit well with you know as many people, and I understand that. But it's a it's a major major motivation in terms of getting stuff done and creating stuff. So you asked me the question before about the Americans and New York Yacht Club. Well, they were highly competitive. They were not in the business of losing the America's Cup. And that was the environment that we competed in within the, uh, uh, you know, within the America's Cup. That they tried everything to disqualify us or to make our life easy. You know, when they, when we defended, and I wasn't involved, but when we defended in Fremantle in 1987, hail fellow, well met. We we made everyone totally, you know, uh, uh, brought them to the to uh, Fremantle, and it, you know, it's, the hospitality of us Australians was fantastic. Totally different in Newport. You had to pay for everything. You had to get everything done, you know, but they'd been seeing everyone off for 130 odd years of competition. And they'd do the same, you know, with us. It's just a different mindset. Even though we talk the same language, we're talking about a different country in many ways, particularly when you're going up against them in a competitive environment, for example, in the world of international sport. So I want to talk about 1983, and this is, um, and this is you've done this many, many times before, and I'm going to try and put a different spin on it. Um, because I sort of understand why the 83 America's Cup Challenge was so spectacular for Australia because Australia had gone through the recession, going through the recession, Ash Wednesday, bushfires. Australia was pretty down, uh, and I get all that. But for me, the fascination with the America's Cup has been the personalities. Yeah. And when I did prep for this interview and I watched the Australian story piece that was done, that sort of came through as to what 
the team that Alan Bond, Warren Jones, yourself would put together. Great characters, fascinating characters who really brought to life something that was incredible for Australia. But to watch teamwork, to watch leadership at the highest level, for me that was the fascination. And if you don't mind, if I could just run through some of those characters and you can give me a, a couple of sentence answer on your relationship with them and the impact they had and, and start at the top, Alan Bond. Well, amazing entrepreneur, you know, and people have all, all different sort of overviews of Alan. P- people lost a lot of money, but people also made a lot of money on the way up, putting that aside. Amazing entrepreneur. Um, you know, give you an idea, he, Elkan were a sponsor. Uh, he wanted them to be a sponsor of our that last America's Cup, and he sent a note along to the CEO of Elkan. And at that stage, Elkan was producing all the aluminium for his beer for, for Swan Brewery, right? And uh, he sent a note along to, let's say, Harry, whoever was the CEO at that time. He said, Harry, I'd like you to be a, a proud sponsor of our America's Cup project. And Harry looked at this. He thought he needed this like a pain in the ass, you know, to do another losing America's Cup effort. But anyway, they decided to do it. So he sent a note back uh, saying, yes, we'd be proud to be a sponsor. And uh, here's a, please find and close a check for $25,000. And Alan sent a note straight back saying, Harry, thank you for your deposit. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best way to describe Alan. Like, you know, it's just fantastic. Well, the point is, is that that was Alan's fourth America's Cup. He first challenged in 19, when he was 34 years old and technically broke at the time. He was a property developer in Perth. And he, but he just kept going. And as a result, he gathered people, including myself, and these, the knowledge base that was associated with a continuous program. And that was a very, very important. That was Alan's contribution. It was just amazing. His resilience was amazing. And he gave you your head, didn't he, at Newport that year? It was uh, that, that certainly came through. He did. That's right. And I'd lost my confidence halfway through in terms of starting. You know, Dennis was, got the upper hand in terms of starting. And I missed some starts, uh, you know, looking back. And again, it was, you know, I wasn't in the free flow of what we call the, uh, you know, the, the, everything was, it wasn't slow motion for me. And, uh, but he stuck with me, you know, and I knew that he'd stick with me. That was the key. And I was able to get, you know, act together. It's a huge amount of pressure. Uh, but getting into the flow zone was really important. And uh, yeah, but Alan fundamentally very, very, you know, just again, hung in there. And each time, you know, 74, 77, 80, and then 83. People don't remember, you know, the previous losses, but it was all part of the part of the tapestry of what where we came from. Warren Jones. Well, the best way to describe Warren was is that he was bored unless he was in a fight. So he Warren loved the smell of gunpowder. <laughs> <laughs> so he, as it turns out, was ideal in being the foil between, for example, myself as a skipper and the captain of the team, and the New York Yacht Club. And also he was a foil between Alan Bond and the New York Yacht Club in many ways. And he loved the Machiavellian world of the New York Yacht Club in terms of how they went about their business. And they were very, very good at it. And uh, so the bottom line is, is our, that, that our project was not naive in going head to head, eyeball to eyeball with, with the Americans. And uh, Warren was just key for that. That was and Warren always said he never worked for Alan, he worked with him. And that's the way I saw life as well. Working for Alan would be a different world, but working with Alan was, a, you know, in a, in a partnership environment, that was key in terms of getting the best out of all of us, that's for sure. Ben Lexon? Well, possibly the best way I could describe Benny is, is that uh, he was the, the Leonardo da Vinci of this country, you know, died way too young. Um, he could have had a triple bypass, but he thought that all... Doctors were wackos. He went to school at nine and left at 12. You know, basically he was, he was an orphan, unteachable. And not going through, and you know, I have a double degree, including probably the best technology uh, university in the world, MIT in Boston. I remember the, you know, my professor saying, John, until you can solve, until you can put numbers around a problem, you'll never be able to solve it. And it took me years working with people like Ben and indeed Alan Bond to realise that that's not the case. You know, the, both these individuals uh, just thought outside the box. 
and that was Benny, you know, so the wing keel and other aspects of the, that America's Cup project came from this very entrepreneurial designer, Ben Lexon, with no formal education, no Western education in many ways, and as a result, wasn't fitted by, uh, by working inside of a, a box. It's interesting, yeah. Hugh Trahan, your tactician on the boat? Yeah, well, Huey was, he was the most naturally gifted sailor that I'd come across pretty much ever. And uh, he was, again, the right man at the right time, totally infatuated with tactics. And he was my tactical tactician on the boat. And he just lived at seven by 24, drive me nuts. I couldn't get away from him, you know, <laughs> in terms of it, you know, the way he'd want to talk about new tactical ideas and this and that one thing. But that was his world. He just loved it. And very, very skilled sailmaker as well. We we had major problems with the boat in, in going with the wind, with the spinnaker up. As it turns out, that's where the leg that we was key in winning the America's Cup. But initially, we we're slow. We had to redesign our, our spinnakers because the dynamics of the boat, uh, you know, was such that it was it used to wobble a lot more. We had to build smaller, more stable spinnakers. Uh, Huey was key in developing those new shoots that gave us, you know, got us back to be competitive against the Italians and the Brits and so on before we took on the United States. So again, very, very entrepreneurial, uh, not, no, no called so-called um, uh, formal education. And as a result, again, not unfit, was not, uh, yeah, he was unfettered away from the conventional thinking, which as it turns out, very important. Grant Simmer, your navigator. Well, Grant was the youngest tactical navigator in the history of America's Cup when he joined. And he was an engineer, a national champion in the lightweight Sharpie class, which I was when, when I, was, uh, I, pre, I, I was before him. And uh, he was, he was, he's gone on to be involved in 12 America's Cup projects. This last one for the, uh, for the, uh, the British, effectively a $250 million program. And he was the CEO of that. So he's just, and Grant and myself, you know, we'll be sailing together in the World Championships next year in England, hopefully, in the actual class. We're going to team up yet again. And, uh, you know, all these guys are lifelong mates. Yeah. John Longley? Well, Chukos, you know, he, he's Luke Longley's uh, cousin, big boy. The Longley boys are massive. The, and uh, he was our grinder. And uh, he spat blood is the best way you could. You could describe Chink, you know, he would die for the cause and he was our shore base manager as well. So he worked very, very closely with, uh, with Warren Jones. And again, you know, that was, uh, I think that was Chink's fourth America's Cup as well. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of, lot of knowledge here as well within this organisation. And John, the, these, you've stayed close to the, all these guys. Do you see, do you catch up once a year or, or every few years? Well, we just had the America's Cup in Auckland and we're all on WhatsApp, you know, and comparing notes and, you know, we're blood brothers, you know, this, this is the way it is. One of the other guys that we didn't talk about is Tommy Schneckenberg, a failed nuclear physicist, New Zealander. Well, he became a, a, a recipient of the Order of Australia. He was key in the wholesale development. And he, there was no such thing as a problem. It'd just take a little while, a little longer to solve on the back of an envelope. You know, Schnacks was just way out there. So the quality within the organisation, again, to do... The Confederation of Australian Sport voted the Australia 2 uh, success as the greatest team performance in the last 200 years of Australian sport. You know, the X factor within that organisation was amazing. And part of it was the uh, obviously the vision of over the horizon, what's this game going to look like, can it look like into the future, and let's get there faster than anyone else in the world. And we had a value proposition around this thing called trust. And until we got that right, you know, and our backs were to the wall, because we were three, one down, all that stuff. We didn't have that, you know, that, that incredible embedded environment of trust throughout the organization. In hindsight, I, we wouldn't have been able to win it, I don't think, anyway, yeah. So if you, you look back, you would have spent hours and hours and hours together preparing what did you do when there were fights or disagreements? How did you sort that out? Um, through honest discussion. You know, again, our values were around honesty and integrity, uh, transparency of communication, which is really, what, you know, answering, endeavouring to answer your question here. Um, 
respect for each other, that everyone had an equal voice, regardless of the so-called position that you had. Uh, humor, having fun, humility, you know. But we had we had jokers throughout our, our organization, you know, it's because you'd you know everyone would get too serious. So we had um, you know different people doing crazy things. We had the red card, you know, when I, ever I blew my top, I'd have to wear a a, a a a red card with a big smiling face on it, and then we'd I'd pass it on after a week to someone else. You know, it's all part of the fun of breaking down the environment. Intense. You know, we we're that last project. We we're there for Newport, Rhode Island. We we're there for eight months, and we had four days off in eight months. In other words, seven days a week for eight months. You know, we're at war with these people. So again, the compatibility, to give you an idea of compatibility, we actually live with each other together for three months, the whole team, before we went to America in the customs house outside of, uh, in Williamstown in Melbourne. Yeah, because you're in Port Phillip Bay doing the testing, weren't you? That's right. And that was to check out our compatibility. We had to let some of the people go because they, didn't brush their teeth properly, correctly, or, you know, all these crazy, silly things. But we just, we knew the compatibility in a war zone, and I, I you know, and it still wasn't war, but for us it was, it was vital. We're off to war. We're off to, you know, we're in the business of doing something that no other sporting team or nation had ever done before. We actually believed that, not totally initially, but ultimately in the, 11th hour, that was the belief in the organisation. It was hard to kill off that organisation, hard to kill that team off, regardless of the whether or how far down and out we were. So when you look back on it, pretty interesting ingredients for that team to come together. And all these characters pulling together, from Bondi to Warren Jones to Stackenberg, all these, you know, Benny with his crazy ideas. Ten, you know, he come forward with 10 ideas. I remember the first time we went sailing, which was over in Fremantle, and immediately he said, John, we should change the boat. I, I've, I've got better ideas. I said, Benny, give us a break. We'll just put this bloody thing in the water. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I can. we should pull it out of the water and change the keel. Or, you know, I forget what it was, you know, but God bless him. He was just, you know, he's never satisfied. That was all part of the ingredients when you look back at it. Yeah, I mean, as I said, I, I think it's it's one of the great stories about bringing people together and, and quite an eclectic group as well and coming together for a greater cause and and your leadership is obviously something that stands out right through it and they talk about it, your team members talk about it, how particularly when you're 3-1 down, the role that you played. So if I can, I know you've done this thousands of times, but if I can just quickly go through uh, the final, the, the seven races and, and I'll do it reasonably quickly, John, but the, you had obviously gear issues uh, in the first two races after that, after race two, were you starting to worry about the boat and whether the boat was going to hold up? Well, we're more, more, not so much worried. We're just frustrated that we'd even, you know, with a program that we pride ourselves as we were very well organised, that we could go sailing and gear would break, even though we'd be testing equipment all the time, both in Australia and then in Newport, Rhode Island, with very little gear breakage. But we're talking about Murphy's Law now where things happen and uh, so these crazy things happen and uh, you know it impacted on our on our uh, our ability to race the boat to its full potential so we got ourselves into a three one down situation so the americans only had to win one more race it was best you know who, who won four races and we had to win three on the trot and um yeah for all different reasons we got into the three one down world and then that was a the big the, you know the big fight back and you you talk about a lot about um in sport pressurized situations and it almost got to a point didn't it where um you and the team were thriving on that as far as making it one race at a time bringing it back to the ba- basics which was a formula that that would then run through the rest of your life about um focusing on process not the result and and that's clearly what happened after the fourth race. Well, that was the only way we could go forward. You know, there's no other rationalisation. And, of course, people talk about one match at a time, all that stuff, which is true. And for us, the only rationalisation is one race at a time. And also the other really important thing is not to, not to fear the consequence. well, not to dwell on the consequences of winning or losing, which is like cancer. 
you know, the consequence of winning, regardless of where we were, three one down or whatever, or when we were three all, the consequence of winning was enormous, you know, to be so-called national hero, because we, you know, we weren't stupid. We knew that was a big deal. Or the consequences of losing and maybe not ever wanting to come back to Australia because you have to be talking to all these people in the street of why you didn't tack or jibe or got on his watch, you know, seemingly a lot of people were watching at that stage. And I, I remember telling them at one stage, I think it was possibly about 3-1 down, I'm not sure, but we're in the crew house beforehand before we went sailing, racing. I said, look, guys, you know, just imagine you're on the back of an eagle. You know, this is my crazy way of looking at life. Uh, and you're on the back of, the, uh, back of an eagle and you're a thousand feet in the air and you see our boat going through the water. And, you, you know, these boats have a bow wave and a stern wave. It's just drag, as it turns out. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you're flying above the water like these new America's Cup boats, you have, a, you have this so-called parasitic drag, bow wave and stern waves. And I said, you go down, you have big scissors, you get the eagle to drop down and you cut off the bow wave and you cut off the stern wave. And I said, and then you release the beast. You release the potential of our boat if we can get rid of the, all that drag, all that consequences of winning or losing out of our mind and just get on with the world of just racing this boat at optimum performance and, and uh, executing our tactics and all the different elements at optimum decision-making. And if we can achieve that, then we'll get invited to come back the next day. In other words, we'll have won that race. It's pretty basic stuff. It's not rocket science. Yeah. And uh, that was a, certainly was our philosophy, you know, just to get rid of the consequences of winning or losing out of our mind and just play the game as we know it, as we, we knew we could. And we were there for all different reasons, but it was, it was as it was. So, so it was a philosophy of, uh, you know, this laser type focus of executing our game plan as best we could on the, you know, each day and you see what the consequences or results would be. So you get to three all, um, are you sensing the Americans are concerned by this stage? And what um, we haven't spoken about Dennis Connor, but what do you think of Dennis Connor back then? I'll talk to you about after the race, but yes. what do you think of Dennis Connor and, and the way that you were, the psychological advantage that we, you were trying to pull over the Americans? Well, the um, Dennis wrote a book called No Excuses to Lose, a very illuminating book, and that, but primarily, and it's right, if you're out, develop, out budget, and out train relative to your opposition, then you, there's no excuse to lose. And that's pretty good. And he had all these different elements in his back pocket. Well, we came along and we had the audacity to cover the boat up uh, so that you couldn't see the keel, the underwater sec sections of the boat. That was the first time anyone had ever done that. But we had, we had a radical keel at that stage. Was it faster? As it turns out, we had a slight advantage in some conditions. And as it turns out, it, it was a little slower in others, but the opposition didn't know that. We sailed the boat extremely well during the summer against all the other nations. We had to beat the Canadians and the Brits and the Italians and the, the French and so on before we won the right to take on the United States. And our win-loss ratio is very good. We won 48 out of the 55 races over a seven-month period of competition. So Amazing. You know, yeah. yeah, it's a big deal. And for all different reasons, but we got the boat getting faster and we redeveloped sails and you know all these different things. And um, that final race, they called it the race of the century, the final race. They actually, Americans had changed their weight of distribution of the boat, increased the sail air, reduced the weight. They found the loophole in the rules. As it turns out, they were highly competitive that final day. They were just as fast as us, upwind and downwind, although, yeah. And um, it was one of those things where, you know, the, when you look back on it, the psychology uh, that we had developed the mystique of this boat where they couldn't see what they're racing against was of great concern to Dennis and his afterguard, his tacticians and navigators and so on, to the point looking back on it that they made more mistakes than we did in that final race. And I would have made, um, I just don't know, but I would have made maybe a thousand decisions in a three hour race. Now they're, now they're 40 minutes, we're racing in three hours of competition. It's a very totally different world. Uh, no less intense on the boat, but regardless of that, it was one of these things where, um, uh, you know, out of a thousand decisions, just as a skipper of the boat, a lot of it was instinctive. Uh, in hindsight, I I've made less mistakes than my counterpart, Dennis Connor. And John, the 
take us through the decisions as you rounded the the boy after the fourth leg for the fifth leg. You're down by 57 seconds. What's going on inside the boat as far as tactics and the decision to to go to the other side of the course? What happened? Well, I, I was reminded by uh, by Chick Longley, John Longley, like last year. I'd forgotten about it altogether. Uh, what I'd said at as we rounded that top mark, we, we could just see their numbers. They were so far in front. <laughs> so, you know, for goodness sake. And uh, apparently I, I said words to the effect of, guys, if we don't keep concentrating, we may lose this race. <laughs> How inverted is that? You know, talk about confidence. Talk about a glass half full. If we don't keep concentrating, we may lose this race. So, oh, God forbid. So... As it turns out, we when we said when you mentioned that we went over to one side, well, we were just following the pressurized pressure environment of what we had their so-called wind shifts, and the Americans they actually jibed, jibed away. They went away from us because we were encroaching at them in a very fast rate of, of pace. As it turns out, there were so many power boats out there, massive, massive ships, that the sea was chopped up. It was like a washing machine. You couldn't see the wind on the water, but we actually. When we, were around, when we went around that top mark following the Americans, we had more wind than they did, but they couldn't see that. And they were coming at them at disproportionate speed and they jived away in us, maybe in hindsight, uh, they didn't need to. There was a sense of panic on the boat. Well, actually there was, there was a bit of a meltdown in the communication. We found that out later. And uh, so we actually went from strength to strength. We sailed the boat possibly as close to optimum than we'd ever sailed when we look back on our, our uh, you know, our computer systems. And uh, we got back in the boat race disproportionately fast. We closed that gap. So we were sailing the boat as close to perfection as possibly I'd ever, we'd ever actually had as a team, which is, you know, says something about our organization. And the, in the psychological pressure on the Americans was such that they started to make decisions that in hindsight they probably should not have. It's interesting, isn't it? No, it's fasc- it really is a fascinating story. And that, so you cross the line. It's, I th- I've heard you, you say it's things like relief, um, ecstasy, obviously, and your life has changed forever and, and Australian sporting landscape has changed forever. Talk to me about the, la- the, the few days afterwards because you'd been in Newport and trained, as you said, you only had two or three days off, but you all got sick, didn't you, straight afterwards? Yeah. Yeah, we'd been at it, as I say, you know, for seven or eight months, whatever it was. No sickness at all for the entire organisation. And literally the next day, like, I was, I was you know, close to pneumonia, Raza, our kids, uh, other team members. It was actually a study by the medicos on on human performance and what people can do when they've got to do stuff. So here we were. We went all that time, and then our, you know you might say our guard dropped down. It took me months to get it to get become physically well again. And that's you know I guess when you think about it, that, you know I've never been to war, but when people come back from behind enemy lines having to survive, you know, let's say you're parachuted in and you're living on the, in the land or in the jungle for weeks or sometimes months on end, you, you go into a rehab hospital, you don't go back and party. And that's, that's the world we'd, you know, been, you know, talking to the coaches of the Australian swim program, um, you know, particularly some, you know, people like Dean Barker, you know, so emotional, their recovery will take quite a while. You know, the, and okay, but the adulation of the swimmers and so on, there's no question, it's fantastic. But these individuals put so much into this stuff, you know, it's, it's a huge call on their, on their psyche as well as physical, uh, you know, strengths. And did you get overwhelmed when you got back by what uh, well, it meant to Australia and what the country yes, was doing? Yes, you know what, and I still am, David. Mm. I, I'm just amazed, you know, us Aussies, are, we're pretty... Not so much, well, we're laid back, but we're shy. We're shy, unlike the US. You know, in the US, it's high five stuff. In this country, it, it just doesn't happen. It's a different type. It's a beautiful thing. I love it. But when people come up to me in the street, and they still do, to tell me what they were doing when they crossed the line all those years ago, and fathers or mothers come up and, you know, telling their little kids or their 
teenage kids what we did all those years ago. You know, it's a very humbling experience. So you, you've also been quite public about your battle as to once you've achieved Everest and what to do next and, and it might have been called depression back then. How did you get through that and, and how did you then move on to the next stage of your life after getting to effectively at a very young age, um, you know, the pinnacle of your career? Yes. Well, you know, we talk about purpose in people's lives. And uh, the best advice I had when I was, I was really struggling, it took me about two years. Of, the best advice I had is walk and talk, John. You know, use your name and, and uh, you know, reputation to get into and meet different people and find out what other people are doing and seeing if there are other areas of activity that could be really interesting where you become passionate about. And it's all about passion, following your dreams and following your passion. And uh, so that enabled me to get into a lot of boardrooms, a lot of, you know, meeting some very interesting characters all around the country to, uh, to, uh, but it took a while, you know, it was, I definitely went through depression. At one stage I was with Raza up in uh, Wagga Wagga on a friend's farm and I couldn't even speak. Words would not come out of my mouth. It's just amazing when you look back on it, but it's true. You know, you think when people have depression, it's, you know, the black dog, it's a terrible thing. So there was no, there was the concept of depression wasn't even considered then, but luckily Raza being a nurse, she had great sensitivity in terms of my well-being, and, and she helped me enormously. And then I had this, there's no question. I walked and talked and started to get a feel of what other people were doing. And that was a great help to me. Yeah. Let's talk about the technology and your thirst for knowledge around the way um, the world is changing, whether that's new media or the evolution of social media, um, you know, things like the metaverse. And it is amazing, and COVID's probably accelerated, hasn't it? It's amazing how technology is, has taken off and innovation has taken off over the, particularly the last half dozen years. Well, I, uh, I took the... Uh the uh, swimming team, the technology people across the Silicon Valley about two years ago, we spent quite a lot of time benchmarking the latest because I was involved. I co-founded a company we, and we launched on NASDAQ in the late nineties. We lived in Silicon Valley for three years and did a whole lot of stuff. But anyway, so we went back to the Valley and spent a day at Facebook and the senior exec said then, this was two years ago, that we're basically, what we, the world is basically utilizing maybe 5% of the potential of the internet. 5% of the potential of the internet is being utilized at the moment. God only knows where we'll be there, where we'll be in 10 and 20 years time. But you know, in other words, we're just scratching the surface. The, the credible thing, you look at the Australian Fin reviews, for example, and half the, maybe three quarters of these, of these, uh, you know, the, these daily editions is full of the new startups. And what's happening, of course, is, is that you don't have to live in Silicon Valley or Tel Aviv to be, in, to be able to raise money to do, you know, to disrupt, you know, in, industries, you can actually do it out of Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or wherever, Perth, because we're connected to this global communication, uh, uh, you know, breakthrough called the internet. And we now have cheap enough money and family offices and, uh, you know, superannuation funds are now starting to look at, hey, the world of startups is becoming interesting. And uh, we have this explosion of new ideas and young people being able to do stuff that they've never had the environment of, uh, of you know, being able to do stuff in the past or nor the financial support that they do now. When we started to try, needed to raise money, you know, for this company that we eventually took to Silicon Valley ourselves, a company called Quokka Sports, there's no way we could raise any money. And as it turns out in Melbourne, there's just no infrastructure, no venture capital industry, no, nothing like that. So it's a new world. And of course, we have, you know, relatively cheap money looking for homes now. That's great for this country and great for young people to make things happen. It's an it's exciting period. And COVID is part of that. COVID is part of that. Where, you know, young people... I think COVID's that. accelerated it. Yeah. No question. Yeah. Hmm. It's ex accelerated. People are giving it a go, which is wonderful. Fail fast, learn, succeed. That's why the Americans do it. Now, and, and the Israelis, mind you. Um, John, the great thing about you as well is you've put back um, into Australian sport as well. Your work you've done with the Australian Hall of Fame, um, Sports Hall of Fame has been uh, incredibly well recognised but um, brilliant and I've, I've been there on the nights and uh, they are really important to the psyche of Australian sport. 
Um, so all power to continue to do that. I think the one, the one thing I did want to acknowledge, and I don't think you've had enough credit for it, is the role that you played at Swimming Australia. And we just witnessed some wonderful exploits in the pool by our athletes, which were, which were extraordinary. But I think the role that you played in changing the culture, um, the focus that I know you talked about um, many times when I heard you speak about Swimming Australia around changing the culture, around focusing the Olympic Games on, on doing PBs and... Uh, getting to the, to the Olympic Games to to really uh, perform at your peak. And a lot of the change that you put through, um, definitely, I'm not saying it was all of uh, your work, but a significant part of the work that was done in the pool in Tokyo uh, came as a result of a lot of the heavy lifting you did over the last few years. Yeah, well, look, like any of these situations, it was a turnaround because it was dysfunctional when I got involved immediately after the London Olympics, you know, the still knocks thing and, you know, from board level down, it, it, it was dysfunctional. Uh, but a lot of moving parts, a lot of people involved to make stuff happen, you know, as we've touched in the past. And uh, a lot of things had to uh, be aligned. But primarily my added value is, is that, first of all, I had no background in swimming at all, which was an advantage. So I had no baggage, no scar tissue in terms of who did what to whom, which is really important. And uh, I could walk into a room, you know, full of politics and I had no idea the politics and I was unfettered in many ways. So it was good. And I had this crazy thing called the America's Cup as a credibility index, you know, and, and that could only last so long. But nevertheless, it was important to particularly the early stages when I became chair and president of Swimming Australia. And the, the, the thing was to rebuild this whole idea of a dream or a, a purpose or a vision, whatever you would call it such that it was exciting for people. And one thing I knew is, is that you've got to have a, a vision that's exciting. And I originally started off on the basis of what's this game going to look like in 20 years' time, which was the whole mantra of our America's Cup effort. You know, I've said this in the past, you know, you take any four-year period of the Olympic movement, you get an improvement in performance. But any 20-year, uh, you know, spectrum of the Olympic Games, you have a quantum leap in performance, throwing a javelin, 100-meter sprint, it doesn't matter what. And the Olympics is the cutting edge of human endeavor. There's no question about it. You're either a hero or a bum. There's nothing in between. <laughs> and I'd compete in two Olympics myself. And um, so I primarily came on this whole concept of this project is of national importance. Look at the Olympics. What's this game going to look like in 20 years' time? Let's get there faster than anyone else in the world. So that was the starting point. Let's get there faster than anyone else in the world. We don't even know what freestyle looks like. Freestyle was Australian crawl, started in 1928 by an Aussie. And other than the head going down and the athlete getting stronger, nothing's changed. All we do know is you can swim faster underwater, but you're only allowed to swim 15 metres. It's part of the rules and you've got to pop up. What does freestyle look like? And what's underwater um, you know, look like? All of these things into the future. You know, you, There's no question, in my opinion at least, 10 years, certainly 20 years' time, freestyle will be different. So the question is, you know, this, that's the mindset that we had to take. So that was exciting for people to get on that kind of, you know, thought process. And it was also a consideration of getting trust into the organisation. You know, so we had transparency, no bullshit. Whatever you said you did, you had some fun in the organisation, but you can't have fun unless you have trust, integrity and honesty. You know, um, people have this common voice, you know, thinking outside the box, all of those sort of things. That takes time and then getting red hot people involved. We had to get world-class people. We moved the organization head office from Canberra to Melbourne, uh, you know, just to get some critical mass going. It was very important. So we did a lot of stuff. And then we introduced the military, decision-making under extreme pressure in their world, it's life and death. In our world, it's, you know, for goodness sake, it's the Olympics. It's not, it's not life and death. It's a big deal if you're involved, but. So we learnt off the military in terms of their, you know, the way that they get into their own flow zones and how they can make decisions under extreme pressure. You know, a bullet comes at you faster than the speed of sound. You know, you've, that's called teamwork to, you know, be alive, stay alive and whatever. So we learned a lot from these people. All of these elements came together such that we saw in Tokyo, certainly with the able-bodied uh, swimming, the Olympic uh, program, it's the most successful swim team that Australia's ever had, you know, coming from pretty low base in, um, in, to in, uh, in London in 2012. So it's, you know, a team effort, uh, 
I call one plus one equals three. How do you get people working together so you get magic happening? And you only get people working together if you have trust and you're having and you're enjoying each other's company. So then you're moving into the world of seven by 24 instead of nine to five. And that's a different world. And that's when magic can happen. And that was part of the Australian swim program. You know, certainly our America's Cup effort, that X factor. And uh, I think, you know, to the 11th hour, you know, the coaches, the, the athletes, the support team, pretty impressive what we saw in Tokyo. Absolutely. And, and again, congratulations on the role you played. My last question, and it's a question uh, I'm asking everybody I'm interviewing. If you look back now and at age 74 and you had the ability to give advice to a 15-year-old John Bertrand who just lost his father, what would the advice be? Stay curious. Be a student of life, regardless of what age. Learn as a result. Learn from people. Um, the consequences of winning or losing make it much less of, of, of your focus compared to just getting it on, enjoying life and learning in the process and following your passion. That's really key. Without passion, you have nothing. Well, John, thank you. I feel privileged to have spent this hour with you chatting about your life. It's a wonderful life. It's an inspiration. You're a great Australian. Thank you, my friend. Thanks very much. Thank you.